When it comes to talking about climate change, the big questions are always, is it happening and is it human caused? Because you can argue about all the other details, but if both of those things are true, then you have a situation that in some way or another you have to respond to. On this channel, I've looked often about the evidence around different aspects of what's actually happening but I haven't really explored why the scientists and the IPCC say that they have no doubts that it's human caused. Is that confidence merited and where does it come from? Let's have a look. Let's be clear what this isn't because people get confused. You need to separate climate science from climate policy. Identifying where the science is robust isn't a process of saying that you should run America in the way that Al Gore or AOC thinks that you should. And likewise, finding areas of uncertainty isn't the same as saying that complacency and inaction is the way to go. All of those things are points of debate. None of the answers flow automatically from the science, which is about what's happening, not necessarily what you should do about it. At its simplest, this is a two-part question. Part one, what are the drivers of the current global warming? Part two, what's causing those drivers? And particularly, why is there evidence that it's us versus anything else? Because we know that through history, the climate has always changed. And you'll often get sceptics saying that the climate always changes. Well, it does. But like everything else in the universe, it doesn't just happen randomly. Changes have causes. Increasingly, we study the world and we come to understand causes and we compose hypotheses about other causes where we don't yet have evidence. But we know that whatever changes happened in the past, they didn't just randomly happen. Something caused them. Some people argue that if change happened in the past and we can't explain why, and the medieval warm period certainly didn't happen because people were driving SUVs, they point out, then can you really be sure that what happened then isn't exactly the same as what's happening now? Well, yes, you probably can. Our ability to study exactly what happened in the past is constrained by the fact that we don't have satellite measurements of multiple factors for that period but we can study the drivers of what's happening now. And if the drivers of what's happening now are things that we've created and couldn't have existed then, then we're reasonably certain that they were different phenomena. Otherwise, all you're doing is using our lack of detailed data of the past as a weapon against everything we know about the present. It's not that there's no questions to be asked, but it's not the main point. So, from the studies we've done, what do we know about what has an impact on the climate of the planet? We know that solar insulation, the energy we receive from the sun, obviously has a warming impact. Over geological timescales, the amount of energy coming from the sun has been gradually increasing. In the shorter term, solar cycles that last around 11 years with variations in the amount of sunspots means that the amount of sun's energy we receive fluctuates slightly. Some will argue that there are more complex esoteric mechanisms from the sun as well. We know that greenhouse gases such as CO2 and methane have a warming impact. If you watch my video on the climate history of the Earth, you'll see that they had a major role in shifts of the planet to and from major glaciations. We know that the presence of aerosol particles in the atmosphere can have a cooling impact because they inhibit the amount of solar energy getting through. We know that a major generator of such particles has been volcanic eruptions. Major changes and mass extinctions have, as best we tell, often been caused by the most globally dramatic instances of volcanic activity. We know that the amount of reflective surfaces has an impact. Dark surfaces absorb the sun's energy, white ones reflect more of it back. So the amount of ice cover, the amount of cloud cover, is hard to track historically, but land use is certainly a factor. We know that ozone, both as a greenhouse gas in the lower atmosphere, but also in form of the ozone layer in the stratosphere, has a modest warming contribution. And we also know that in addition to those global big picture factors, you get more of a local phenomena, creating short term and or localised changes. So for instance, again, from our climate history of the Earth, it wasn't until North and South America joined together and the ocean currents changed accordingly, though we got the great ocean circulation, the AMOC forming. 
It plays a big part in moving heat to different parts of the planet and in creating the frozen conditions at the North Pole. And likewise with the regular El Nino and La Nina conditions which will add warming or cooling respectively. So there are various aspects that will create short-lived and often geographically specific variability. Now that's different to the global averages, which come down to really just one thing. How much energy enters the atmosphere from the sun versus how much is radiated back out again. If those two are out of balance, particularly with more coming in when he's going out, then you have global warming. Wherever that energy specifically ends up within the overall climate system. We've studied all of these different aspects, the potential drivers of climate, what are called climate forcings. Here's a graph of the different forcings created by climate scientist Zeke Hausfather for the website Carbon Brief. The black dots are observed surface temperatures from the Barclay Earth Surface Temperature Project. The grey line is the line you get when you add all of the global forcings together. As you can see, there's a pretty good fit, even on what's quite a simple statistical model, between observed temperatures and the aggregate of the forcings that we can measure. Observed and all factors. Now it's not a perfect fit. The period 1900 to 1920 starts with lower observed temperatures and then quickly climbs back towards the line and they then cross the line and keep going to be above it up until about 1950. Those are climate puzzles still to be solved, but otherwise broadly a good fit. Now the one contributing the most warming is greenhouse gases. And of course, we surely all know by now that one of those, the greenhouse gas CO2, has been increasing over recent history. We measure it in the atmosphere, where it's a well-mixed gas, and we measure it in the oceans. We still have to look at where it comes from before we can nail it as a human-caused aspect, but we do know for sure that it has been increasing. But as you can see, left of their own devices, the increase in greenhouse gases would have warmed the planet more than we've actually seen. So other things are going on as well. And the biggest one of those is the counterweight effect of aerosols. Those industrial processes that kicked into high gear and put out a lot of CO2 since the start of the Industrial Revolution also put out other pollution and particulates and that has had an overall cooling effect. Without that offsetting the CO2, the planet would have warmed significantly more. Then we have land use changes, which have added a very modest cooling effect. We have increases in ozone, which is added to the warming effect. We have solar variability, which shows small bumps related to solar cycles. And we have the effect of volcanoes. And you can see their impact when you look at the variability in the grey line of all the forcings. Some of those are human caused. The aerosols definitely associated with our air pollution. Some of them, solar, volcanoes and the like, are natural. But you look at that and clearly the key factor in all those forcings is the greenhouse gases. And predominantly that comes from the carbon dioxide. So how do we know that the increase in carbon dioxide, that that comes from human activity specifically. I mean, we've seen levels of CO2 increase in the past in the process of deglaciations, for instance. So why couldn't it be the same as what had happened in the past? Right now, the concentration of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere is at 416 parts per million and is continuing to rise. This is approaching a 50% increase since the beginning of the Industrial Age, when it was near to 280 parts per million. There are two factors commonly cited as to why that increase is traceable to human activity. First, it comes down to the specific carbon isotopes involved. The carbon produced by burning fossil fuels has a distinct molecular fingerprint, a different ratio of heavy to light carbon atoms. So carbon's made up of three different isotopes, carbon-12, carbon-13 and carbon-14. Plants have a preference for the lighter isotopes and of course fossil fuels were ultimately produced from ancient plants. Hence the carbon derived from fossil fuels has a different ratio. As CO2 is released from their burning, the percentage of carbon with the telltale fingerprint increases. 
And even if some would argue that the carbon-13 ratio isn't unique to fossil fuels, the fact that the carbon-14 ratio has also decreased significantly rather confirms that the changes are not from modern sources. We've known that this should happen with the burning of fossil fuels since this study, Ravel and Sus, in 1957. And more recent studies, such as Levin and Hessheimer, 2000, have confirmed that work. But what about those natural processes in the geological past that release CO2? What was that mechanism? Broadly speaking, either the Earth got a temperature bump from its cycle around the Sun, which then led to gradual outgassing of CO2 from the natural environment, particularly from the oceans. In that case, CO2 was initially a response to warming and then a prompt for additional warming. So it wasn't the first mover, but it was an amplifier. Or long-term volcanic activity contributed it. So when the Earth was really in its most extreme frozen state, so-called snowball earth. It's believed to have been volcanoes that pushed CO2 into the atmosphere, which then, because everything else was covered in ice, did not weather out of the atmosphere over time as it normally would. So two historical processes. There's no evidence for either of them created changes anything like as quick as what we're seeing today. We know that we don't have the extreme long-term volcanic activity that'd be required because we'd kind of notice that going on. But also, it can't be outgassing from the ocean because the percentage of CO2 in the ocean has been climbing, not reducing, which is what you'd expect if it had been increasing in the atmosphere and being absorbed in. And not only that, but the same distinctive carbon isotopes are also detected now increasingly in the ocean. There are certain proxy measures, such as annual tree rings, which in some cases go back thousands of years, which can be analysed for their carbon isotope makeup. And they suggest that at no time in the last 10,000 years has that isotope footprint existed in the way that it does today. It began to appear when we would have expected, around 1850 AD, when fossil fuel burning started to get into full swing. The other factor that it's hard to ignore is the apparent correlation between the quantity of emissions we would expect to have been released by all the fossil fuels that we can calculate we've burned since 1850 and what we see in the atmosphere and in the oceans. Studies have been carried out that suggest that approximately 500 billion tonnes of carbon would have been released into the atmosphere. Atmospheric concentrations haven't reached that level because natural processes, particularly the ocean, do have the capacity to absorb some of the CO2, hence the increase that's found in the ocean and in the biosphere. But the fact that it can't keep up is testified to by the fact that it is indeed increasing in the atmosphere. So if you see CO2 increasing in the atmosphere and human-caused emissions are of sufficient quantity to achieve that rise, you'd have to have an extremely strong alternative evidence base to cast doubt on that. When it comes to natural sources and sinks of carbon, none of them are actually capable of creating or destroying carbon. So while there continue to be some natural emissions of carbon, which have historically been broadly in balance with the absorption of carbon, there is zero evidence of a natural environment just suddenly decided one day to kick out a bunch of CO2 at the rapid pace that we've seen. The final cherry on the cake, I guess you could say, is that with all that carbon-based fossil fuel being burned, you would also expect to see the amount of atmospheric oxygen declining. Because when you burn fossil fuels, the carbon binds together with the oxygen to make carbon dioxide, for clues in the name. When we monitor the atmosphere, atmospheric oxygen levels decline at exactly the rate we would expect from a fossil fuel driven CO2 increase. If the CO2 was coming from a different source, a natural source that didn't involve combustion, we would not be seeing that. If we separate out the natural processes and the forcings that we've seen in recent decades and look at what would have happened in the environment had we not been emitting that CO2, you can see that it would remain broadly stable with natural variation. Indeed, it would have been a very gentle cooling over the last few decades. The result of this is, big picture, we see an energy imbalance in the solar radiation coming in, and what is being radiated back out again into space as thermal infrared radiation. If more comes in than leaves, then it has to go somewhere, and about 90% of it goes into the oceans, with the rest warming the land and the atmosphere. 
A study this year found that Earth's energy imbalance approximately doubled between 2005 and 2019. It found this using satellite observations of the net radiant energy at the top of the atmosphere, and it compared it with an array of measurements across the climate system. Norman Loeb of NASA said this, The two very independent ways of looking at changes in Earth's energy imbalance are in really, really good agreement. And they're both showing this very large trend which gives us a lot of confidence that what we're seeing is a real phenomenon and not just an instrumental artefact. Add to this the fact that if warming were caused by greenhouse gases, you would expect to see a warming surface and lower atmosphere, but a cooling stratosphere. And that indeed is what we see. And that's not something you would expect if, for instance, changes were because of solar insulation or something like that. In that case, you'd expect to see warming at all levels. So look, there are many things about climate change that are not settled. The detail of what models say will happen for different scenarios, whether there will be the sort of cascading tipping points that some of the campaigners suggest that there will be, those are not settled. Some of them highly dubious, lots to discover and to debate. The reason why people say that these core questions are settled, the planet is warming and we're causing it, is because of what I've described in this video, multiple streams of evidence, all of which point in the same direction. CO2 increasing, the isotope being that associated with the burning of fossil fuels, the decrease in oxygen being what we would expect if this was the source of the carbon, the correlation between the quantity of CO2 and the amount of fossil fuels we know we've burnt historically, satellite measurements top of the atmosphere showing an energy imbalance, lower atmosphere warming, stratosphere cooling, CO2 increasing in the ocean, so a net sink for CO2, not a source of it. Ultimately, the various often highly creative alternative explanations have very little evidence at all and certainly do not have that correlation of multiple streams of evidence. That shouldn't really be controversial. As I said before, there is no one policy implication that necessarily flows from this. The fact that the people who have always argued, say, for maybe a radical form of socialism, that those people will jump on this and say, if you follow the science, it means you have to do what we've always said you should do. That, of course, is political opportunism. The line of argument that says, something must be done. This is something. Therefore, this must be done. The evidence does imply that something should be done, and that something should be appropriate to the scale of the challenge. And it's down to us to engage with a problem as one to be solved, rather than, you know, the potential apocalypse that should terrify us into taking desperate and slightly dodgy solutions to be the appropriate response. If we do that, it's probably the case that a lot more sensible solutions will come out than currently fill the polarised political discourse on the topic today. That, however, is a matter of choice. In spite of what some people tell you, there is always a choice. By the way, people often say we should make reference back to what we've seen in the distant past to understand how all of this may play out. I made a video recently on Earth's climate history, which trawls through the fascinating and dramatic changes that life on Earth had to navigate against all the odds to get to where we are today. If you've reached this far, you might want to watch that video next.